All right, well, hello and welcome everyone uh, to this week's episode of the Neurology Video Journal Club. Uh, my name is Lauren Jackson. I'm Assistant Professor of uh, Movement Disorders here at Mayo Clinic Rochester. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, and um, I'm Farwa Ali. I'm also Assistant Professor of Neurology here in Movement Disorders at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And uh, today, both uh, Farwa and I are going to be talking about this article called Association of Motor and Non-Motor Symptoms with Health-Related Quality of Life in a Large Online Cohort of People with Parkinson Disease. And this is by Bach et al. It was just published last year in Neurology. And just to kind of get started with the conversation, you know, I'll just mention a little bit of background, especially um, kind of in our world of Parkinson disease, the last few years, there's been more and more emphasis on looking at uh, measures of health-related quality of life. So um, these are kind of um, ways that we can clinically assess um, patients' overall experience of their disease and kind of general wellness. So kind of trying to find ways to reach beyond just sort of measuring motor scores or MDS, UPDRS scores. Um, so that's kind of the, the main kind of overall uh, purpose of this article to kind of look into that further. Uh, I agree, Lauren. I think this was a very important addition to the literature and health-related quality of life metrics, as we know, are of increasing interest. And they they quantify, you know, the disease burden, the impact of the symptoms, and capturing really that lived experience of the individual patient. Um, however, you know, these health-related quality of life outcomes can be quite variable, uh, difficult to quantify at times, uh, and, and what's more challenging is to assess how different factors affect the impact of any given symptom on health-related quality of life, and how should that be translated into clinical uh, and research um, sort of applications. So, um, you know, an important background to this paper uh, that we already know from previous studies in Parkinson's is that motor and non-motor symptoms impact health-related quality of life. Uh, and we also know that that impact uh, seems to vary um, by age, sex, disease stage, and the economic burden that the patient uh, or individual living with Parkinson's is experiencing. Um, so this article really does a great job of building upon our existing knowledge. They use granular data from the Fox Insight study, and uh, they look at health-related quality of life in a lot of detail using different symptoms. Uh, and by doing so, they're able to really assess the uh, interaction of motor and non-motor symptoms and its impact on health-related quality of life while considering demographic diversity, the economic strata, different clinical subgroups, uh, and really assess that interaction. Yeah, so, you know, as far as, you know, kind of the methods and how this study, you know, was designed, um, it was mainly cross-sectional, so kind of just a snapshot in time. And it was really, it was based on this prospective cohort of patients through the Fox Insight study, like you mentioned. So just for those who aren't aware, that's a large online cohort of, um, you know, uh, 35 or so thousand patients who have Parkinson's disease um, who kind of fill out these longitudinal surveys periodically to kind of assess their experience um, of disease. And, um, you know, there are a lot of different kind of uh, measures and questions um, that go into that cohort. Um, so with this study specifically, they were able to include just over 23,000 patients who completed um, these quality of life measures. And really the main um, way that they measured health-related quality of life is through this EQ 5D 5L tool. And so that is um, a measure essentially that uh, encompasses these five dimensions or domains of health. Um, and it's been well validated in multiple diseases, but uh, especially in Parkinson's disease. So that's why they used it. Um, the main dimensions that are within that, the five are kind of activities, um, self-care, um, pain, mood, um, and uh, just general mobility as well. Um, they are able to kind of use how people kind of scored themselves in those uh, domains. And that generates a single score that they were able to convert to an index that's normalized against the population. So they could kind of compare, um, you know, better or worse quality of life um, to that, uh, that average. Um, so that was kind of the main, main outcome they were looking at. Um, the demographics um, that they included um, were all self-reported and that included sex, age, um, yeah, disease duration, you know, a few clinical factors, medical comorbidities, um, they use the MDS-UPRS part two to look at motor outcomes. 
Um, and then they use something called the NMSQ, so the non-motor um, uh, questionnaire to, uh, to look at non-motor symptoms. Um, they also had a few more specific measures of depression, uh, as well as um, a cognitive impairment um, that they looked at as well. Um, so kind of got all that data, and then overall they're trying to look at, you know, how do motor outcomes, non-motor outcomes relate to healthcare quality of life or health-related quality of life, and then also how those different demographic clinical features influence that. Exactly, and I would just add a little bit to that, that, uh, you know, they found that people with more severe motor symptoms had uh, and, and those who had higher medical comorbidities had a poor health-related quality of life, as one would expect. Uh, and they were able to identify some important non-motor symptoms that similarly sort of adversely affected health-related quality of life, including poor sleep quality, depression, um, cognitive issues like forgetfulness, uh, poor concentration that people can struggle with on day-to-day -day basis, um, and um, sadness, you know, symptoms of depression, uh, and also falls. I think that really points to that impaired independence, need for increased um, help uh, day to day. Uh, and, and, and those were all sort of significant findings. Yeah. And, you know, I think the most, and like you had mentioned, you know, there were other studies that had kind of showed, you know, similar findings. So, but, you know, certainly, you know, with this huge cohort, you know, it's, it's nice to see that, you know, that's confirmed. Um, but what was really interesting to me was kind of the interaction analysis you know, and specifically with the demographics that they looked at, they found that in females um, and those of lower education levels and lower income, um, depending on the motor score, more severe motor scores uh, resulted in worse um, health related quality of life in those populations. So in, in those groups, you know, they're more severely affected um, when they have more motor burden um, or more, more bur a higher burden of motor symptoms. Um, in addition to that, um, they also found that uh, those who had depression, as well as more cognitive impairment, um, all of that was, of course, related with worse healthcare uh, or health uh, associated quality of life. So, um, so that was really interesting. Um, and really, they concluded, um, you know, overall, these neuropsychiatric symptoms, especially like you mentioned, the falls um, in terms of mobility impairment is really um, associated with uh, with worse health uh, related quality of life. So anything else as far as, you know, results wise that you, you found interesting in this paper for our, anything else you wanted to mention or? Yeah, you know, no, great summary, Lauren. I think this is, uh, like you said, that interaction bit is really interesting that we know that all of these non-motor and motor symptoms affect health related quality of life, but recognizing that they may affect different people differently. Uh, so someone who is female, someone who's of a lower socioeconomic class or lower education level may, may be affected more, may bear a bigger brunt of that burden of, of you know, the, that, that amount of motor or non-motor symptom. So I think that really points us to um, health disparities research, being, being mindful of how these different symptoms are affecting patients differently. Um, so I think that 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 is a, a big take home message from their results uh, that they have been able to uh, to demonstrate. Yeah, so, you know, overall, just kind of as far as limitations go, just to mention, um, and this was, you know, the biggest one, but you know, authors kind of addressed it right away too, um, was the selection bias. So um, it's a huge online core I mentioned, you know, they had overall 20, uh, 35,000 patients who actually had a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease in this cohort. Uh, but only um, 23,000 um, or just over 23,000 um, completed the health related quality of life questionnaire. Um, so, so there is some bias there. And when they looked at, you know, those who didn't versus who, who did uh, fill out that measure, um, they did find statistical significance um, in that um, people were more likely to be non-white who didn't complete the questionnaire, more likely to have a longer disease duration of more than three years, um, as well as um, uh, more likely to be young as well, though that was just about one year difference. So that, that was a, a huge factor, um, but I think is important. And they did suggest that that could have led them to overestimating some health related quality of life um, um, because of those demographics. Um, also, and then I think this makes sense to those who might have lived in more rural communities or less in, uh, likely to have good internet access. Um, those who had more cognitive impairment at baseline might have been less inclined to be participating in the study. So that could have also led to overestimation of some of those measures. Um, 
those were kind of the main limitations that that I saw. Um, anything you wanted to add to that, Farwa? Yeah, you know, no, absolutely agreed, hundred um, percent. I would just add that you know we we want to remember this is a cross-sectional study, and these are self-reported measures, so it may be difficult to assess the cause or the reason for why there was this differential effect in different patient groups uh, of of how a motor or non-motor symptom. Uh, led to poor health-related quality of life. For example, um, motor symptoms um, worse health-related quality of life in, in women. And um, we can't really assess why that would be. Is that due to the disease biology itself? Is the disease worse? Is that due to interaction with healthcare or health-seeking behavior? Uh, for example, we know that women are less likely to get DBS surgery. So is it that there is different healthcare, either access or utilization, that is causing that differential health related quality of life impact from the motor symptoms. Um, and again, that's uh, kind of not, not necessarily a limitation of the study, more that that's something we can't confirm based on this data and that requires further work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and to kind of just go on that, you know, with the uh, race uh, factor as well, um, you know, there was just a study recently that showed um, white patients were five times more likely to actually undergo DBS than black patients. Um, so there's definitely a discrepancy, um, you know, and, and DBS is a huge part of our practice, obviously, in, in advanced Parkinson's. So um, I agree, you know, I think, you know, clearly dis disparities are, are there in our, pa in our patient population in Parkinson's disease and going to really have a huge impact in our ability to interpret a lot of these outcome measures and even clinical trials. So um, you know, I think definitely, you know, supports that more research needs to be done really um, in healthcare disparities and Parkinson's disease to kind of help us um, further um, investigate and, and kind of understand it. Um, absolutely. I think, you know, despite uh, some of these um, limitations, uh, it's very, it's a very novel analysis. It's a very large cohort of patients. They've, uh, they have demographic, clinical, socioeconomic uh, information that's being uh, assessed with that health-related quality of life. Uh, very, like I said, extensive sort of clinical motor, non-motor um, information that they have on these patients. Uh, so certainly these results are very important to discuss and, uh, and have important uh, implications for clinicians and research. Uh, and I, I'll let you take that away, Lauren. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree, you know, especially, you know, from a clinical kind of point of view and clinical research kind of point of view, um, it's really helpful to have this to kind of support, you know, the relevant clinical scale. Yeah, this is a this is a way that we can really um, get a better sense of, you know, where people are at with their uh, health related quality of life as it pertains to Parkinson disease. Um, you know, I think it really directs us to kind of use more of this individualized approach, especially clinically, um, where, you know, same disease symptomatology, you know, motor burden um, clearly can have this huge um, uh, variation in how it impacts our patients um, and their, um, you know, and their disease experience and, and, and their ability to live, you know, the way they want to live. Um, so I think, you know, at least for me personally, you know, the patients I see in clinic, you know, even though I might screen for depression, you know, falls, et cetera, you know, I try to address these things in my treatment plan, knowing how much those could affect some groups of patients more than others. Um, and really, you know, tailoring kind of, you know, your, your clinical treatment plan to the individual patient, I think is going to be key. Uh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think to me, yeah, as, as a clinician, you know, as uh, just like you, a movement doc, that was the first sort of feeling I got from reading this paper that from a clinical perspective, it really brings that consideration, that individualized aspect front and center, that when we are talking to patients about their motor, non-motor symptoms, and we are focusing on symptom management to improve quality of life, really being mindful of assessing how are these symptoms affecting their quality of life, um, and, and making that part of our management decisions, and uh, being being cognizant of how those factors may differ between patient groups uh, and considering that really is uh, clinically sort of the most uh, important. Um, and then from a research point of view, I think health-related quality of life uh, really encompasses uh, the impact of motor symptoms, non-motor symptoms, neuropsychiatric, cognitive, uh, really the, the, the width of it all. And I think it should really be focused as 
and important outcome measures, like you said, when we assess a uh, response to treatment, you know, maybe we can improve the motor symptom scale, but are we also improving the health related quality of life, uh, the burden that individual impact on that uh, person with Parkinson's disease. Uh, and I think it, this, this paper also gives us uh, inspiration for important work that needs to be done, uh, such as in health disparities, um, right? Different, different patient populations, different individuals living with Parkinson's, how are uh, symptoms affecting them differentially? What are the reasons for that? And, and how can we help improve? How can we help improve care for patients with Parkinson's uh, in these different um, gender, socioeconomic, cultural, and other strata that, that they looked at. So I think it's certainly very inspiring work. Totally agree. Well, I thought this was a great discussion. Um, you know, thanks everyone for listening and, um, you know, hope, uh, hope everyone can take a look at this article. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the wonderful discussion, Lauren. Uh, I had a great time discussing the paper and I hope the listeners had a great time um, reviewing the paper and this journal club. Thank you very much.